staff. Um, I expect others to be trickling in as it is a study session. It's not open for public hearing or public input, uh, but we are discussing the ULUC this evening and specific policy topics and also focusing, I believe, on, well, chapter six and nine, maybe, uh, maybe uh, the re-release of whatever issues have not been covered in, in previous meetings. And I did want to say for the few of you that are here um, that I just did watch the last, the last week's, uh, and I'm glad I did because there's some really good discussion. And you all looked really good on TV. So, <laughs> um, so um, anyway, um, yeah, uh, I understand that the, the revised uh, staff has been working very hard on revising the draft, and it's up online now, and I'm eager to you know, dig into it and start looking at it. In the meantime, let's uh, try to, we have about an hour and a half to um, discuss remaining issues. I think the focus was on the design standards, correct? Design standards and a couple things with the neighborhoods. Okay. So. So do you want to start off with an overview of that, and then we'll, we can go around and... Sure. So we'll, um, just to kind of catch us up, so the last time we were together, we did talk about housing, um, and we uh, just, just specifically about ADUs um, and duplex conversions. And I do have to say um, we had this kind of similar conversations and questions that we asked City Council this past Tuesday. Um, and they did ask, well, what did Planning Commission say about these things? So I was able to share the notes that I had taken um, at the last meeting with them. So I think that was really helpful, especially when it came to um, duplex conversion. So they did make uh, give, provide a direction on that, so you'll see that direction um, in the draft that is now available at envisionlittleton.org. Um, we also discussed parking and loading. Uh, council also discussed that. So um, I did say that some of our planning commission members uh, had said go for no parking requirements, so that, that was not a popular decision. Um, among council, which is fine. So they did ask to bring back, at least for large scale developments, a maximum parking requirement. So we're going to keep with the minimum parking requirements and then for large scale development, we've um, instituted, you'll see in the draft, um, some maximum parking requirements on that. Uh, we did have a discussion as well about reduction in parking spaces provided if you're within a quarter mile of transit and also if you have some bicycle amenities. So council agreed with those. There was some discussion. Should it be a quarter mile? Should it be a half mile? Should it be a mile? Um, stay with the quarter mile, which is what we're seeing in um, what is it, ID has, has that recommendation kind of best practices that we're seeing on the planning side. So we've covered those two things with lots of sub bullets. So tonight I wanted to um, jump into design standards and some questions that we had on that. And I, um, I have this computer open so I can take notes um, on what we discuss. So. Do you want to introduce? Oh yes, I should. And if you've noticed, um, Reed is not here. That does not mean we can all go wild because we do still have legal <laughs> representation. Um, so Ashley Augustine, what is your exact title? It's really long, Senior Assistant City Attorney. So I work with Reed and I'm gonna cover for him tonight. Yes, and Sorry for being here. No, 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 no this is great. great. Um, Ashley is the attorney assigned to the Historical Preservation Board. So she works with them very closely and therefore be in mind very closely. <laughs> All right, so on the design standards, we have, let's see, can I count? One, two, three, seven specific um, items that we're looking for some direction on. Uh, so talking about design standards and the discussion of do we want to have uh, the robust design standards that have been introduced with the Unified Land Use Code? Uh, one of our thoughts initially was, okay, are we just having the robust design standards within downtown, or do we want to take them out to the whole city? And how the code has been written right now is um, 
basically outlining roof materials, building materials, articulation um, in all of the building blocks. So again, if you remember, the building blocks are neighborhood, business industry, downtown, corridor mixed use. That's it. Yes, those, those yeah. four building blocks. So we've introduced design standards for all of those building blocks. So I want to talk about that. Um, and then buffer yards and greenscaping. So we've actually received quite a few comments on that in ENCODE. Overall in ENCODE, we've received nearly 700 comments um, from the public. That does not include staff comments, that's just from the public. So we did get really great input. Um, talking about the type of species that should be allowed in buffer yards um, and along streets. So I'm gonna be relying on our landscape architect here. Um, and then also talking about the use of height, both plane and stories, um, and then how we are thinking staff-wise, how our Littleton engineering design standards, which is something we are developing, and how we'll integrate those back into the ULUC, um, and then a uh, few corridors. So that's kind of an overview of the design design related issues that we would like to get a little bit of feedback from you all that are here. Thank you, Robert. I'm um, hearing you on the TV and you here. It's great. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I was hearing your um, So in terms of our first bullet point up here, so specific design standards do appear now in each building block um, of the ULUC. And should, should this remain? Um, to have the specific design standard, so I'm talking, again, roofing materials. We outline what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, what can be on the primary facade, what can be on a secondary facade. So are we, are we comfortable with that, um, or is that something we were just looking at for, for downtown? So it's okay with you, Craig. We'll just kind of go around. Yeah, yeah, I think we should. Uh, yeah, so uh, Bruce, you want to start, or do you have any? Thoughts on that, or I, I would favor design standards with a light touch outside of downtown. Uh, I, I think it's appropriate. Certainly, what we've got downtown has been vetted well over an extended period of time, and I think it's is well understood and uh, meets the need. When you start moving into the neighborhoods, I think there's a growing appreciation that some of the neighborhoods, if not a lot, most of the neighborhoods do have some level of architectural congruity, for the sake of a word, uh, you know, mid-century modern whatever that that the design standards have an applicability to in terms of preserving what my sense of the the community you know is trying to do with the you know what we're trying to do with this document on behalf of the community so i that, that would essentially i won't go a whole lot deeper but i i think on, the, on your first bullet up there, I'd, I'd be comfortable extending it, but I would emphasize something of a light touch. I don't think we should be mandating, you know, color of brick or uh, roof pitch or, you know, such. I mean, I think, you know, as long as building codes are being adhered to, I, I think that's appropriate, but, but within that context, I think it should be more than suggestions. I think standards are fair. Okay. Great. Thank you. Well, uh, I agree a lot with what Bruce was saying. I, I agree there has to be a balance. It's finding that balance, of course. That's the hard part. But, you know, one of the things that uh, Kenning and Case Collaborative is very good at is allowing to have more uses. And we've combined a lot of things now with the idea that we have standards so that there is still a flow and a continuity. So I think if you uh, 
don't put enough standards in, you can get a mishmash. And I think one of the things are what Bruce has said, and I agree, yes, heard the same thing, that, you know, the community is looking for, you know, some sense of continuity. So the standards are appropriate. I'm, I might not be quite light touched, but I do agree there has to be a balance. And I'm sure Dan will give us some ideas about that balance. <laughs> But uh, definitely keep them. And as far as I know, there's nothing in, in the neighborhoods. The neighborhoods have much more free. Uh, I didn't see anything in here where it shows the neighborhoods had standards as we do our industrial and our commercial and our, our mixed use and that sort of thing, which is also appropriate. Yeah, the, um, <clears throat> the neighborhoods really will go back to some of the building types that were introduced in the downtown. So, okay. You know, one of the things that I really appreciated in here was, is, you know, when we did that tour of our downtown, we walked with historic preservation, and we're looking at the back of the buildings, and that's when you start realizing it's not necessarily the most lovely view. So if you're walking down Alamo and you're looking at the back of Main Street, it's not particularly pretty when you see what's behind there. So I appreciate it here where you're trying to get a more 360 of where it's needed, not all places, obviously, but, uh, you know, pre preserving the beauty so that someone isn't looking at the back of someone's building where suddenly it's just not pretty anymore. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I tend to agree, I think, with Bruce and Robin, that um, a light touch on uh, in each section specific to um, our preserving the character of our neighborhoods. I think that's what this is all about, um, scale-wise. Scale, scale and form, I think, are most important. Um, but, and I also, I, I do kind of like the level of detail that's uh, associated with design in the first chapter. Um, and to the extent that each uh, subsequent chapter and each zone can refer to that, and it's all in one place, you reduce the risk of uh, redundancy or missing something. You know, it, it's all in one place. And then the description in each one of the, the subsequent chapters then has that light touch and it you know maybe talks at a little higher level about what the sort of character drivers are uh, both from a, a structure and a landscape greenscape um, perspective i think so um, yeah I, I i would support that um, you know again brick colors um, you know, I, I think that architectural congru congruity i think you said i think that, that, that is a good way to des describe <laughs> those <laughs> yeah, i like that uh, and yeah i would say like each uh, a lot of littleton neighborhoods are of an era i would say you know they were all built you know within a, a certain time period and then another section was built and each one of those areas has that architectural congruity <laughs> so, so, um, can you spell yeah, that? I think, um, yeah, I, I think we, we, the way it's written now, it's an attempt to preserve some of that, but I think it might be getting into the weeds too much. And if it could just refer back to chapter one and have, you know, all our design in that section, it would be good. You stole my thunder. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think um, the design standards or the general design standards in chapter chapter one is, is the place to kind of, and maybe we need to include a little bit of a narrative of sort of what the goal is. You know, the neighborhood's design within context, you know, context or character, just sort of what the sort of the, uh, the gist of, of um, or maybe it's something that was in the, uh, um, comprehensive plan, uh, just that the citizens want continuity or congruity or something, but sort of set the table there. Um, and, you, and there's a bunch of stuff on wall articulation, yada, 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 yada there, so that's good. And, and I agree uh, to, to reference back. We're sort of doing it with buffer yards now, if you look at that. You know, each section talks about buffer yards, but always cross-references back to what's in Article 10, uh, 10 1, um, 3. So I think that makes sense. Um, I agree, it, it, you don't want to have redundancy. Ideally, when, as a user of codes, you just either want to go to one place or go to another place, like 
I don't want to hunt and peck and try to find stuff. So uh, I would agree to sort of co-locate it as much as possible. And if there is something that, uh, if there's like a supplementary design um, standard, maybe maybe that can be included. But I, I didn't go back and sort of cross-reference. Each block has, you can use dormers, you can use this, you can use this. Is that is that the same as what's in 10.1.3? Um, so it's, you know, it almost be like this analysis to see if there's anything that's left still in, um, in uh, uh, you name the building block, that that's, that's unique to that building block. That could be a, a supplementary design standard. Um, that's good. I'm so glad to hear that you guys like the, the setup, because that was when we got the first draft, it was all the design standards were re repeated in each of the chapters, and we're like, just put them in one place, and well, we're happy to be in these two places. <clears throat> I think so. it'll help too when, uh, because the way the document's set up in ENCODE is you, if you do a word search, it's going to give you a whole list of links, right? As opposed to maybe one or two links right. where you just go to see all that information. So I think that's the way most people, especially developers, are going to look at it. They're just going to search for a word uh, and uh, find it in you know, chapter one. Section one. Right? Excellent. I think we kind of touched on this second bullet point with the uh, building blocks, just focus on the building place and mass. I did. I did hear comments of more of a. Let's see. Focus. Yeah, focusing on the scale and form more than anything else in terms of of the design. So. Um, yeah, those two are definitely related. Um, and also bringing up, I mean, the, the intent of the ULUC was allow more uses, a lot more flexibility, but have it look a certain way. So I, I'm glad to hear that it looks like we're achieving that. Yeah. So, um, all right. So buffer yards and greenscaping and the impact at size of dome that can occur. So this is more of a, a, of a clarification that I have for all the questions that got asked about this. So the greenscaping is kind of all inclusive. So your buffer yards aren't in addition to greenscaping, in addition to landscaping, in addition to your setback, in addition to your open space. It's, it's all together. So the buffer yards are part of your open space. Um, so it, we did hear um, that the buffer yards, so we came up with three different types, if you remember that from reading, you know, kind of type A, B, and C. Um, so we did play around a little bit with those widths and where buffer yards would be required. So I believe the how the code reads now, it's more the buffer yards are more important in your edge um, when you're transitioning from one zone to the next, or you're transitioning from a single story to a two or three story building, that the buffer yard would get wider. Um, we did hear in terms of buffer yard, like in commercial areas that, okay, do you really have to have a buffer yard if it's commercial against commercial? So we put kind of all these different scenarios in there of when you apply which buffer yard. So I think, I think that will be clearer. Um, I would like to ask the question in terms of greenscaping. Obviously, that is something that we heard is is very important in downtown, as I, the greenscaping as well as the buffer yards, because we're just it's, is it too urban um, in parts of downtown? Let's get more green back in. Do are we comfortable taking those standards again outside of downtown, which is how we have it right now, um, and having buffer yard requirements? And more greenscaping requirements. So we're asking for more trees. For example, um, I believe we have is it six six trees along the corridors or hundred percent. Oh gosh, I'd have to look that one up. It yeah, seems like it's been changing. Yes. this past few months, but yeah, I can um, look it up. So an em it's still an emphasis on greenscaping throughout the city, not just in our downtown. So more 
Is is everyone comfortable with that approach? Uh, you know, of course, we've heard some from some developers that are. I don't want to put in that much landscaping. That costs money. But if that's what we're hearing from our citizens and our mission and city council, comfortable moving forward with that. So, yes. It's not over and above what an open space requirement would be, right? No. So it's just it's, part of it. it's steering the direction of uh, plant species or some sizes of trees. How many yeah, trees? Like trees. Yeah. It's like creating standards for how we want to see our green, just like we're creating standards for how we want the buildings to be in general. Again, looking for a balance, I, I think, you know, you've already stated that our community does desire that. And um, if you're, I think about driving down a boulevard like Mineral with all the trees versus, let's just say, Santa Fe or Broadway where there's not a lot, there's a big difference in how that looks and it also provides you know the greenery <laughs> is soothing <laughs> driving down broadway is not it, is not. <laughs> it could be part of our traffic calming plan greenery <laughs> and i would say so mike in terms of our current code like the whole open space was was difficult to define. We we did not have it very well defined as to what qualified as open space. We had unobstructed open space and right. I, so currently we have a percentage of unobstructed open space that's required in each district. There are a few special areas in town uh, around Broadway where you're required to have that buffer uh, in the front. You know, I think uh, more than 20, 25% of the total requirement has to be along the front, uh, the frontage of the business. So there are some unique uh, areas in town, but uh, uh, really the unobstructed open space was, uh, and, you know, we have discussions with developers about this all the time. It's, you know, there's a specific definition that as long as you can't drive on it or park on it, and it's not part of the building area, um, it counts as unobstructed open space. We always argue with developers about rooftop areas. And we've had discussions, and, and we finally kind of had a policy of, no, we're not going to include rooftop areas in, in unobstructed open space. So yeah, those are sort of the current issues. The buffer yards would, would uh, be a little bit different approach. You'd still have open space requirements, but you'd have these, it directs them in more areas of the city and directs them to kind of edges where you have a change in zone district or a change in character area, it seems to me. Yes. Um, Bruce, you want to start and go around? I, I think Mike, described it well I, I think again this is an area that's been well thought out I, I like Jennifer what you said about the you know the and what Mike's repeated as well the the, the buffer yards sort of in you know the transition between zones is is entirely appropriate and, and proper uh, I I think within the context of the open space requirements, you know, having some sort of a buffer overlay as appropriate if you're going from you know, two stories to one story or three stories to two stories or whatever those configurations look like is 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 good. But I don't. My sense is that what we what we've got and what's been vetted again is is quite good, and I don't have an awful lot of you know substantive comments beyond uh that in terms of changes that i think would be appropriate nothing to add i appreciate what you and mike were saying and yeah obviously i have a lot of thoughts on on this um <laughs> I would expect nothing less. <laughs> yeah, remember um, eight o'clock that we said. <laughs> so I think I, I included a lot of comments in the. You did. In the and draft they, they were taken. Very 
criteria. I'm eager to see how they're addressed in the revisions. Um, but, you know, the, the key is, um, you know, I think the, the visible frontage of uh, properties that front uh, streets, that's our public realm, right? That's what we experience as residents in the building. Um, I, I guess I'm not as concerned about what people do behind their homes that you can't see from the street. Uh, although, um, you know, hopefully people are responsible enough to provide shade and, and maintain landscapes. But the concern, I think, is really along the street. Uh, and I think that's what this addresses now and should address um, the um, creation of what I call a tree lawn, but just sort of a, a a continu continuous uh, row of trees along as many streets as possible, especially in residential neighborhoods, but also in commercial areas as well. Uh, I think, you know, the South Park industrial areas are well done, well landscaped. Uh, that should be mimicked in other commercial developments. Um, and to the extent that we were able to either infill or reduce the amount of surface parking we have, there's more opportunities there for uh, landscaping between the street and the building. Um, trees obviously provide shade, which in today's warming climate are, are, are really important. Um, but if you talk to any city forester, you can also have too many trees and they could be too close together and that's not healthy either. So getting the right locations, the right species uh, is critical. Um, and I, I see very often people love to plant trees right next to their house and they regret it, you know, 20 years later when that happened, then the tree might is dropping branches on the roof and the insurance company won't insure them. So, you know, there's also spacing requirements from structures that I think are very um, and then there's the whole sustainability uh, question of, you know, why should we plant turf grass because it uses so much water and we're in a drought period. Um, I, I think that the more urban you are, the more, the more dense the neighborhoods are, the more they can support usable lawn areas because they they also help for cooling and just outdoor spaces outdoor rooms and that type of thing so i wouldn't discourage um, ornamental irrigated landscaping i think the idea of including zero escape as it is in here is good but there's got to be a balance of um, of sort of conventional landscaping and and zero escaping that uh, allows um, a sort of quality of life in a in a suburban or more urban uh, neighborhood. So, um, and I think we should um, uh, have require, well, I, actually, I guess this is a question. Do, I, I think I might have read it in the draft. Um, do we require professional design, like landscape architects, yeah. to design anything that's non residential or Multi-family residential because I don't think you can, a single family you can't require that. But right, but I think multi-family and, and commercial would require a, a professional okay. landscape architect yeah, to do a site that development. It's in the old landscape code, but it, I'm glad uh, to see that it is in there. So we don't really have um, kind of the operating standards built into this uh, draft code. So we've got a little bit of work on the implementation side. But I would expect that we would still require, as part of any uh, site development plan or site plan for these commercial projects, that a landscape plan be provided and a, that it be probably done by a, a professional landscape architect. Okay. I think that's important. I think it can give city staff when they're reviewing, or it should give city staff when they're reviewing the plans, at least a sense of, you know, at least there's a professional designing this and they know what they're doing. Um, so and and you know with them they're trained to you know look at um, water efficient you know hydro zoning irrigation systems and that type of thing so that that should address the concerns we've heard from the public about sustainability and uh, excessive water use in the landscape and um, so, so but um, yeah that's that's my soapbox I, yeah, yeah thank you uh, you stole all the words out of my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Again, <laughs> uh, no. I was going to say, I think the, I mean, I, I think this, the concept of the buffer yards and how they're you know, sized uh, between uh, the different sort of zone districts is that's appropriate. 
makes a lot of sense. So um, I, I don't have any additional comments. To well, that was when I forgot to address the buffer guards. Um, I, I think every change in zone should have a buffer yard um, in the chart, but in some cases it might be zero. Like if it's an R, or it's a, a different. Um, Get the, the terminology of the new residential zones, but say it's small the lot, oh, it's small lot, lot, to medium, medium lot, lot. There may, it may be zero. But if you go from large lot to um, quarter mixed use, then there would be a buffer zone, right? Correct. They would have a distance. Yeah, um, so I'm just thinking of the way that developers or other people would use this. You know, if you see all. Um, if there's a matrix where each zone next to each zone uh, is, and some of them have zero. I believe we. That's 10. If it's if it's 10 1 3 point six point F point two. <laughs> <laughs> if I knew how to search on here, I'd get to it real But I mean, it is. It's a matrix of yeah, if it, it's the district buffer yard requirements, and it shows you uh, sort of compares if you're a, a CM against a. Industrial, you've got to have a buffer yard B. Okay, so it's already in there. Tells you must have been where I got the idea. <laughs> <laughs> you got the Pen Two standards for buffer yards as well, or greenscaping for da yeah. for downtown. Uh, well, so there's the general standards that go. Uh, that's, that's what I'm looking at. Referred to Dan, yeah. and then there's also. Oh yeah, shoot, that's DT design. Mm -hmm. Never mind. DT Excuse has me. its own, right? And yes, then, but does. everybody else refers back to the uh, general design standards, buffer yard requirements. Yep. And Which is nice. Parts, I, I mean, and you will see that the downtown is now in the code and integrated into it. So, is the land use map in the code? I know you're trying to get it in there too. It is. It is separate at the moment because we're we're still working on it. So okay. we do have a PDF online. It's at envisionlittleton.org, and click on the menu, and then click on zoning map. Okay. And it's the only one there. Okay. So it's it's. And that's the it's current a draft. version, but it's still in works. Okay. Yeah. All right. As of three o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> so we were working on it up until then with a consultant. All right. Um, question came up about species a lot of buffer yards and along streets. Um, in particular, uh, evergreens and the use of evergreens. Um, should evergreens be allowed as a street tree? Um, or it, we also, part of this discussion is kind of the size of landscape median areas. So a long street and a parking lot, what should, should and shouldn't go in there. Um, we did get some feedback that evergreens as a street tree probably wasn't a great idea just because of visibility. The shade and mm -hmm. um, yeah. snow removal. Yes. Yeah, I, um, I guess my thoughts on that are um, diversity, plant diversity is important. Um, Evergreens are sometimes underutilized. I think in Littleton, because of the era, a lot of it's been built out. I think there's more evergreens here than most other cities. Um, but a lot of them are very mature and they're huge and they have impacts on adjacent properties, not right. only on the on the owned property. So I, I think we should encourage uh, the use of evergreens, but probably not as a street tree. Um, in buffer yards, I think they're very appropriate because they provide additional buffering. But I think there may even want to be some suggestion of a setback from the property line. Uh, for example, I have a neighbor who was literally thinking of selling their house and moving because the adjacent neighborhood, be, the neighbor behind them, had planted three or four very large spruce trees um, that keep their backyard in shadow all day, all year that they can't even really grow anything, not even grass, in their backyard. Um, and they can't do anything about it because it's the neighbor's property. So I think there should be something in there about how far they're placed from the, either the property line, the street, um, some guidance along those lines. I don't right. know. Does the CSU extension stuff kind of get into how close you should 
plant things, or is it really just focused on species? I, I don't think so. I know there's a lot of species, other yeah. ones out there on that, but I don't know if the CSU extension addresses spacing or distances like that. Is that sort of best, are you seeing that as best practices in, in sort of the landscape world? Yeah. This they isn't your own bias. This is this is sort of what we're what you're hearing, right? And it, you know, it's it's a lot, it's similar to building a house right on the property line, right? The impact on the neighboring property is shadow and scale. If you plant an evergreen tree that gets to sixty or eighty feet high on the property line, <laughs> that has an impact on the adjacent properties. Um, so we get calls very frequently about uh, property line issues, uh, not just related to trees and that type of thing, but uh, usually our, our viewpoint uh, for property owners is that you own from the core of the earth to the heavens above along your property line. You can, <laughs> uh, in those case scenarios, I mean, we always advise people to talk to their neighbors, and that type of thing, but yeah. So I don't know what that looks like in terms of code, but I think, you know, along the lines of guidance of, you know, you're, you should plan or you must plan, you know, this amount. Well, if you do plan a diversity of plants, that they should be arranged in such a way that they don't have impacts on adjacent properties and even adjacent street right of way in the, in the case of, you know, streetscape. There are streets, all, you'll see them all throughout town where there's evergreens and um, the shadow is on the north side, right? Um, and you, it's iced up while you're, you can't even use the sidewalk. Uh, so. Yeah, typically in plan review, if we see a, a large evergreen or a large uh, uh, shade tree, coniferous, or excuse me, large uh, coniferous or a uh, a large uh, shade tree on right on the near the property line. We try and advise people that you want to be able to maintain your whole tree. So in plan so, review, would it help to have something in here that gives them a little bit more direction on that? It so, may. Yeah. Although people generally kind of come to the common sense conclusion of, gee, yeah, we want to be able to maintain that whole tree. So does Denver does Denver have sort of a palette of trees that you can that seems like you, that you can use? They have, a, they have an approved list, uh, just like we did in the old landscape code. I think we do now, right? In here. We refer to the CSU. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, you want to provide flexibility. You don't want to make sure you want to make sure there's no noxious weed trees, right? Um, Russian olives and that type of thing. But yeah, I'm pretty sure Denver. Um, at parks, we don't maintain an approved list, but we have the city forester, that, and theirs is always changing, <laughs> especially with temperature changes. I was just wondering if the city has, does Littleton have a, a, a palette of tree, you know, trees that they want to use? I mean, I saw there are, like, you can't use box elders or, you know, all the... Obnoxious stuff. Worth referencing the arborist. Uh, if somebody has a question, we're hiring for one right now. If yeah, anyone would no, like that position. <laughs> yeah. So uh, currently, we have a list of, of noxious plants and trees. Correct. And uh, I think in our in our ULUC draft, we kind of tune that up a little bit to go with the. Uh, University of Colorado, or the CSU extension uh, list. It's kept in, in a better state of I, th I think that's a really good reference because they, they're in the forefront of research on what works best in Colorado. They're always trying new things to get more diversity. Um, they have award winners every year, and it changes every year. So, you know, to put a static list in there like we had in the 1980s, um, a lot of those trees are either not available anymore or frowned upon. You know, ash trees, you know, not going to plant ash trees now. So, it's um, a good idea. Yeah, just reference that. That's nice. Okay, anything else? Okay. Uh, 
videos on species. I, I just wanted to comment too, and I put this comment, and I might have said this before I put it in my comments in the draft, but um, the, the original landscape code that we had in there was really good. I think it was really well written. It was well ahead of its time. So um, I, I don't know that we've lost any of that in here, but um, I, did, I just wanted to comment that, that was pretty strong to begin with. I'm glad to see it's actually part of the code. Okay. Oh, sorry. All right. So this next one, um, use of height, bulk plane, and stories confusing, and are all measurements necessary? So some clarification on this one. Height, um, we discovered that the right narrative explaining how height should be measured was correct but the diagram associated with it was not, it didn't match. So we have rectified that situation. Well, it's um, the measuring to the peak. Correct, correct. Kind of peak or at the flat roof or whatever. We also um, have added a note in terms of what constitutes a story. So we are talking for a first floor, and this goes back to, I think, something that you had brought up. So a first floor can be up to 14 feet. Um, and then any subsequent floor up to 11 feet. So that starts determining what your height could be. So if you have recommended stories, then your recommended height would, the maximum would be, so you had a three-story building and you, you basically assume 14 feet for the first floor and then 22, 11 and 11. Um, so all of that together. 36, I think, is, <laughs> is what you would be looking at. So we're, we're specifying what constitutes a story. Is that per, by use then, too, what you described? Right, or, right, so a, a multifamily apartment would be, 11, would be 11 all the way up. I, no, not 14, 11, 11, 11. Correct. Okay. Correct. A commercial might be 14 and then 14. Yes. So that then you would have recommended stories, but your height would vary depending on the use. And I would have to verify it that that's how it ended up. That's what we we're talking about. So I would encourage you to take a close look at those tables when we're talking when we have both density, floor area ratio, um, height. And stories this and is 14 to make sure it all adds up. Pretty good standard. Well, 14 is, is for like a commercial use. So if it was downtown, it would be 14. And 16, you could have. Oh, I think we decided on 14. 14 is good. Right. For a commercial space. Or it's mixed good use for, building. For mixed use building, main floor. Upper floors can be 14 if it's an office use. If it's a residential use, it's probably around 11. Uh, Okay. So yeah, take a look at that. Um, we also have introduced the concept of bulk plane, and this really gets to, again, those transition edges. So when you're transitioning from one zoning district to another, or one type of building to another, or a single story to a third story, a, a three story, we introduce the concept of bulk plane. So you gotta start stepping things back, um, uh, or even from the street perspective. What does that look like from the street perspective and stepping back and maximum height? So we've kind of we have we've we've combined all of these concepts together again in in an effort to have transitions um, between different uses. So I guess the question really is, does that make sense? <laughs> um, and is it the proper use of height and stories and bulk plane? You guys will probably need to take a closer look at how that all worked out in each of the tables for each of the building. Yeah, blocks. I guess my question is for the architect. Um, it sound it seemed to me from the comments that I read that there was some confusion or misunderstanding or not knowing what bulk plane was. Right, that word is kind of new in this community. Right. Um, but it's been used, I mean, it's a pretty conventional term in most form-based codes, at least. Um, 
So is it just a matter of getting used to it, or is it, is it, is it important to keep? Well, so I mean, just a couple comments. So um, I know bulk plane is defined in Chapter 1, Standards for All Districts under General Provisions. It shows an, a diagram of a bulk plane. Um, but I couldn't find I couldn't find anything that referred back to that diagram in the code. So when I look at each building block, it it talks about bulk. Um, but when it talks about it, it's, in my mind, it's talking more about how to modulate a facade rather than reducing scale. I mean, they're using okay. uh, vertical vertical articulation, horizontal articulation. So, you, you know, not necessarily. When I, when I think of bulk, I'm, I'm reducing, I'm carving away at a mass rather than putting pinstripes on it to make it look smaller, if that makes sense. Yep. So I think that, so one, yeah, so I understand the concept of a bulk plane. Uh, it's, it's meant to create a sort of a, a stepping down of massing. Um, it, it's appropriate when you have it between, uh, it's kind of like the buffer yards. So when you're uh, two different districts, you'd want to step down to uh, um, lower masses. If you keep what are, what are you looking for, as well? I can. I was trying to find the diagram for the whole So plane. it's uh, yeah, it's um, it's ten. It's actually ten one two point four measurements and allowances. So it's all the way down the bottom. And, and this, I mean, this this diagram is. Um, is sort of like the Denver diagram for when you have res when you do residential buildings next to other residential buildings. Yeah. That's sort of what that's what that's what you see. Um, so you're saying it was going to introduced here, but you didn't see it referenced. See, in yeah, place. if I go look at the um, you know, uh, I didn't look at downtown, but if you look at quarters of mixed use, it talks about bulk, but it's really talking about adding. Uh, vertical lines for sort of wall articulation, so it's a little confused. Great catch. I have a question. I'm just looking on the ULAC here, and remember how when you hit menu, there was a place that you could search? And I don't see it in the menu anymore to search. Yeah, it seems to be gone. I, I just realized that too when I was trying to find that. <laughs> yeah. I was like, wait, my little back back view, I have the search function, but I will we we will make sure that that gets turned on. Wanna add well Robin, go ahead. Um, do you have any other comments on the I think the uh, bulk planes essential for transitions. I, one of the things that came out very fervently from the community was the transitions are so important. So it has a, it is essential as part of that. And, and I believe that is also covered in, um, let me get to it here. If I can contextual well 1013 design has all those sort of strategies mm -hmm. um, and uh, I believe it looked like one of them was updated um, transition standards yeah 3.5 well I'm looking at uh, upper well I'm looking at I'm looking at uh, standards for all districts 101-3 okay. design and there's varied massing techniques. Uh, and so, you know, it talks about side step backs and a change in height at the end of building shall count as a massing variation technique. And then talks about where. Um, it also talked about that you need to step it down between sort of these trend, you know, between districts. Thank you. 
upper level slide, step back, the step backs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, there it is. Effective in providing transition to a sensitive edge into public. Okay, so. So there's, I guess, yeah, that is a, that's a technique to to reduce bulk uh, at sensitive edges. That makes sense. I get, I get that. I just, I don't understand the the other one where you, the other diagram that you had that is more sort of seems like more for residential. Bruce, do you have any questions? Strikes me that the that this topic is illustrative for uh, architects and engineers who are engaged in projects, and as such, uh, as long as with the caveat that that the measurements are have all been you know, correctly calculated, and everybody's comfortable that. They're representing, they're accurately representing what's intended, and I don't see where less is more in this case. I think, you know, you need that level of detail for people who are going to utilize it in terms of doing the projects. And I think it's it's appropriate to have it. And, and it, it, as a non-architect and non-engineer, I, yes, I'm, I can understand what's more or less being directed, even though I don't, you know, the calculations are over my pay grade. So, uh, but that doesn't mean that, that, you know, they shouldn't be in the ULUC. Uh, it's not confusing to people who understand the concepts. And uh, to me, I, I feel like the measurements in all likelihood are necessary as long as, again, they're accurate representations of, of the intent. So. Anything else on bulk plane or height stories? Go on to the next. And these next two are more kind of for informational purposes. So we are in the process of, well, more than in the process, we, we, we have them, but we're learning how to integrate them, um, on the Littleton Engineering Design Standards. So this is really what we as a city are saying, we want new streets to look like this. When streets get redone, this is the width they should be. This is the sidewalks that they should have. This is the bike lanes that they should have in them. So obviously we have the Unified Land Use Code, is a little bit ahead of those. So you will see reference to Littleton Engineering Design Standards or LEDs um, throughout the code and know that those are coming. Um, we anticipate those probably, I think, first quarter um, of next year. So that will be something when we, when we look at the first iteration of, all right, what did, what did we see once we release this that we need to change? Um, the the LEDs will then be integrated into the into the ULUC at that time. So they are coming, which is exciting, and it, it really has a lot to do with the transportation master plan that we did in conjunction with the comprehensive plan. Um, we really started setting forth as a city what do we, how do we want to promote walkability, how do we want to promote um, better transportation, multimodal. Um, that's those sort of qualities. So you'll see those in the in the LEDs. Um, we also in the ULUC have introduced, and I, I mean like it's a section and a placeholder for view corridors. And as we um, dive more into depth on um, say Littleton Boulevard or on Santa Fe or Broadway, um, and as we get into more historical items, that will become a topic of conversation. It is definitely something that needs to be vetted more in the community because um, uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? And what somebody might say, we need to maintain a view corridor, another person say, it's not worth affecting the property rights of somebody for that. So, a bigger conversation needs to be had on that, but we at least introduce the concept and have a placeholder for the future on that. So 
any thoughts on different ways to, to do that? Or it sounds like a good toe dipping <laughs> in the water. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's a there's been instances of this. The library. Well, the melting pot. What was the Carnegie Library? There is actually a view corridor easement in the deed uh, that's filed with the county. Yep. And that restricts them from altering of the property because of the because of that issue, and then. There have been instances, for example, uh, I think, I believe it was Ancient Arts, wanted, she wanted to put a, a second story or something on her building a few year, number of years ago. Mm -hmm. And the folks directly to the east, I don't remember is that, if that's the Coors building or which building that is, but they objected to her cutting off the the landlord or the owner of the other building cutting off their their view and of course the answer was property rights you can do whatever you know if it's if it's within the zone standards then the owner is within her rights to to do to do that and it just is what it is so it's these things obviously have value to people the, the the view corridors are valuable intangible assets, and I think they should absolutely be placeholders. And we should have a conversation about as a community. You know, what do we? How do we? Do we want to protect them? And how do we do that? If if that's the right answer, which it may very well be. Nothing to add other than I'm sure there's other communities who have already done things like this that we could look at and oh yes. <laughs> use them as examples. Yes. Some of them will probably be examples of what not to do. So <laughs> just important. Yes. That, uh, you know, they are. Like Bruce was saying in our community, there's are there are things that are important to our community. Those need to be protected. Yes. And then you can start to get to well. Maybe this isn't as important, but is it important enough? That that, that uh, gray area is that's where it gets complicated. Uh, yeah, I think on, on the view corridors issue, I think I guess there's a view from and a view to, right? right. And I would think the Carnegie Library example is probably more of a view to. You want to be able to view the building and not sort of screen in anything in front of it. But I think of value to landowners is mountain views, um, primarily. Um, and, you know, they're somewhat limited in Littleton um, to those, you know, along Prince Street and, um, you know, Jackass Hill, you know, where you have those great views and, and on Main Street, and just where that, where it drops down into the uh, South Platte Valley. Um, otherwise, it doesn't really seem to apply in too many locations, but I could see how there are certain areas where we want to be open to, you know, maybe there's a, an overlay district along that geographic corridor north to south but where, you know, if somebody's developing property, they can as part of a, either a master plan as part of a, uh, a redevelopment, um, you know, ask for view corridors to be part of their agreement. Um, again, it's either from or to, most likely from. So I think, I think it's a valid thing to have in here. Um, but I, it seems like it would be, the tool would be a sort of overlay in a geographic area and then with respect to the integration of the engineering standards I, I don't think most communities integrate it with their land use but it seems to me to be a good idea especially since we with the comp plan and the, the transportation plan we're really trying to look at land use and transportation as one thing instead of two things um, so to I, I don't think you can really 
put the engineering standards in here, but you're talking about um, how do you address them or how do you reference them. I think, in my opinion, the best way is to have them look and feel and, and be in the same language and complement each other and not contradict each other, I guess. That's, and since the engineering standards are in development, this will be out ahead of it. Maybe they can sort of follow the lead of the ULUC and the way that they present the information, and the level of detail, and so on. Just the thought, thinking out loud here. I swore I was reading about view corridors last night, but did it get taken out already? The right <laughs> I can't even remember. <laughs> uh, can't anyway, even I mean, even I think. Remember where it was? Yeah, uh, just, it's not obvious. Um, if it survived, it's only a placeholder. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, there wasn't any sort of meat in it yet. As I recall, uh, I mean, there was stuff about like, oh, uh, landmarks or focal points, and you know. So I, it's it's not ready for prime time. I think it needs more sort of development, and sort of community input for sure. So, I, I guess yeah. Do you put it in as a placeholder, or do you just? Uh, is it going to cause confusion if you see view corridors, and then do you? Mm. Just raises a question for you guys. So we may have, we may have pulled it totally so out. Because we can search. Yeah, we can search. I mean, you can put it in the code, right? You could put a block that says to be future, <laughs> future, future placeholder or something. Because yeah. <laughs> I know when they take sections out of code, they leave a block in there like, Deleted yeah, or that's right. Right. yeah, yeah, currently being developed. I'm letting the consultant know right now. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so sustainability, and we actually, we had a, a great conversation with city council about sustainability, and they asked, what, what did planning commission say about this? <laughs> we haven't gotten there yet. Um, so should certain standards be required rather than incentivized? And this was really, we had several comments on this of, you know, it's great that we're addressing sustainability, finally, um, but it really hasn't been vetted with our community and what sustainability means to our community. Um, so it was, the consensus was we haven't had enough of a conversation to actually start mandating um, these things. Um, another part of that conversation that came up is that the 2021 International Building Code, which the city of Littleton um, we will be bringing that forth in February to council to move us from the 2012 to the 2021 um, International Building Code. Energy is a huge aspect of that 2021 code. So some of the council members felt like, let's see what comes out of the IBC um, and then maybe circle back to this. So just kind of looking, looking for your input and your thoughts on mandate, or leave it as incentives right now. I uh, was watching the council meeting on Tuesday and I thought council member Rudnicki had uh, good points in how he described it. He talked about like what you were saying right there about the updated version. And I think what I heard was they're most along the lines of incentivizing at this point, exactly what you said. And uh, the one other thing that I thought Mark said that was important to look at was there's some things it went too far with. Like he talked about adding another floor it seems too far. So, but I know that there was no conclusion on what was too far other than his comment on there. But I did agree with what he was saying that um, incentivizing, yes, but be careful how far you go with what you allow. Uh, the adding the extra floor, 
you know, when you look at adding an, an extra dwelling unit, well, you know, if you're already in a multifamily, you got 46, what's one more? But what if you're in a, in a, in a smaller one, now you've only got three or four, and now you're adding one, now you're changing character. So I think you, you can't just say add one dwelling unit because it affects the different uh, uh, zoning districts differently. It'll have a much greater impact on areas that have lower density than it will on something with higher density. So in, in that sense, it uh, needs fine tuning. I, I tend to agree that it's sustained. The definition of sustainability is not agreed upon universally enough, or at least we don't understand. We I, I have my own strong opinions about it, and I think we all do. But I would want to hear more from what Littleton citizens uh, believe it is and how important it is. So I think incentivizing is a good sort of like a pilot good way to understand what the market can support, what people can tolerate. Um, and you know, I think with something like that, a lot of cities are going all in on it, but I think with Littleton, it feels like it should be more baby steps or incremental improvements. And I think that incentivizing is an incremental. There has to be tangible benefits to, to doing it. So I, I guess I don't have an objection to what's in there in terms of additional development rights, if you will, um, larger foot building footprints or reduced parking, or um, I think those are probably the best ones. Um, additional story maybe in certain locations and in specific places might work. Um, but. Yeah, and, and small small things like um, in, in uh, non-residential uses, perhaps requiring bike parking, requiring charging stations or something like that may be tolerable and appropriate um, as thou shall instead of thou should, you know. Um, so if you're providing vehicular parking in a multifamily residential Community um, or, or non residential commercial property, perhaps we should be required to provide bike parking um, as well. Good idea. Um, mm -hmm. So I agree on incentivizing, not requiring. I don't think we want to go zero to 100 miles per hour right away. Um, We're trying not to. Yeah, so I think that makes sense. Um, so I, I guess what, a couple questions. Uh, where, is this from Kenda Keast, or who who informed some of the sort of the prescriptive uh, options uh, that are in here? Um, and then I would say it was more from from KKC and kind of what they have been adding to other codes that they've been doing. Okay. So the city doesn't necessarily have like a, a sustainability expert or anything like that. No. Okay. Um, and, and, and so my, my understanding is, yeah, like, hey, if I want a density bonus that's shown on this table, I need to get uh, two items from Schedule A below and then four items from Schedule B below. Um, I don't know. Some of that seems, uh, that seems pretty easy. <laughs> um, so to, to, I mean, I, I would agree that, um, that you should be able to have a, a density bonus. Maybe this bar is too low. Like, hey, uh, require more to get there. Um, just some other housekeeping things in this section. It, it does refer to a uh, lead bronze. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, uh, some other, I guess, other considerations too is that uh, I mean, it's it's saying lead certification, which is a great. Uh, green certification program, but there are others and that developers uh, will use that. Um, uh, green building initiatives, green communities. Green communities is, is interesting. We, we, uh, we do a lot of affordable work, uh, housing work, and developers like green communities as a green certification over LEED because LEED is more expensive. 
Breen, B-R-E-E-A-M, is another one that's gaining a lot of traction. And then Passive House. Thank you. And just, I mean, it's 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 almost like it's a it's a conversation because um, there's there's different different project types um, um, re require different strategies. So, say for instance, residential buildings, you like you want to deal with the envelope. It's all about the windows. That's not necessarily the case for commercial buildings. So, so, so what's shown here that we do have this sort of prescriptive list of things that you can go for, but you could refer to these other green green initiatives that are going to take care of those anyway, right? So you may not need to. We may not need to be prescriptive in the code, as long as they're meeting a nationally sort of recognized uh, green certification program. Does that, that make sense? Yes. Always okay. tricky when you have a very specific uh, entity named in the code. Yeah, there's other ones out there. But lead's great. It's just it, it's expensive. But I, I like the idea of um, national green certification program. If you, if you can meet the standards set forth, then national green yeah, the fed, uh, the, a lot of federal agencies will either be very specific about what they want or also leave it sort of generic okay. and it's nationally recognized green building standard okay. is what they'll say. Awesome. I think Dan's made some really good points there. Would agree with what he said. I uh, it, it, a lot of this stuff is in the hopper anyway. I guess part of this is is an issue of you know getting on the train kind of thing because there's seems reasonably clear that there's something going on. I mean the headlines being what they are that and I think we're better off calling our shot in terms of how we want to address some of these issues versus having somebody else do it for us, like the state or whatnot. Uh, so I think ad addressing it or having it as an attribute of what we're discussing here and then the, the uh, output of our endeavor is appropriate. Uh, mandate is, is a harsh word. But I think if it's if it's going to, you know, if it's sort of happening, if if that super tanker is being turned anyway, and then you know, I think we just reference those kinds of things, and or you know, it, it, whatever incentivization we can see our way clear to, which might you know be easier if the uh, sales tax initiative passes. <laughs> That's that was an unpaid. <laughs> you're not paid, so you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, no, I I that I thought Dan made some really some very yeah. solid points. Like okay. Doing well. Sixteen minutes, right? We can do it. <laughs> yep. That was the last three bullets. Yep. Okay. <laughs> the toughest ones, though. It's <laughs> perfect. Yes. Um, so, regarding short term rentals, should non primary, so this is no owner on site, be permitted in neighborhoods? And I will tell you that we are um, discussing this with City Council next Tuesday. That is on their study session, um, along with going over the red light draft and the zoning map. Um, we will be specifically talking about STRs. Um, we introduced the concept and kind of what we were thinking land use matrix wise uh, <clears throat> in regards to short term rentals. And I would say initially what we were thinking was conditional, that they would need to get a conditional use permit. So that would be um, a public hearing in front of planning commission if a non-primary wanted to go in the neighborhoods. Um, other option is not permitted in the neighborhoods. They would be permitted in commercial areas or downtown. 
and wanted to get your thoughts on that. It's interesting. It's almost a yes or no. I almost feel like taking a straw poll here, like yes or no, and then just with an explanation. What's that? I don't have reasons why. Right. And yeah. That's the important why. part is to hear what others are saying. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, and and I bring this up because we were not seeing consensus um, in the comments. It was it was pretty split. Right. Yeah. And in in Denver, uh, when they introduced the owner occupied, it was very unpopular, at least with folks that had short term rentals or wanted to have short term rentals. And um, for a while, I think they got away with it, and then they started cracking down and uh, enforcing the rule. And um, I, I'm wondering how that's going. I don't know if we've heard any. I haven't really heard anything in the last year or two, especially during COVID. You know how that's. There, there, I guess there's an argument um, that um, non-owner occupied uh, reduces the amount of obviously owner occupied available properties within the city that then exacerbates the housing shortage, right? Um, and drives up housing costs. I think that would be my concern. The non-owner occupied ones drive up. Right. So I'm kind of on the fence. I'm not sure um, whether we should require owner. I can see see the arguments on both sides, but I'd love to hear your opinions, Robin. You want to go first? Uh, sure. So in my neighborhood, we had a problem with the non-owner occupied one. It was not solvable through the city. Our HOA then made it that you cannot have the, uh, it has to be owner on site. Um, but the thing is, is, and while that was solved in our community that way, there's a lot of homes that don't have HOAs to protect them. And a neighborhood is not a commercial business area. People have businesses in their homes, but they're subtle. It's not like you're going to see someone sewing their, you know, if they have a seamstress or something like that, that's, you know, in their home, it's not disturbing the neighbors. This disturbs neighbors when it's done wrong. When it's done right, it's wonderful. And it's a huge asset. But the problem is, is, is like I said, in our neighborhood, and that particular owner didn't keep up the yard. So we had a lot of issues with how that looked. And, and like I said, most unfortunately, the city could not control it. And it took this uh, homeowner a long time because, you know, we only do our HOA updates once a year. So they went through many, many months of dealing with this and not having any satisfaction. So from that and the fact this is a person's home we're talking about, this isn't a business, this is a person's home, and they should have the right to not have to deal with that in their neighborhood. So I, I do feel strongly about it from our personal experience, if there was some way to stop that, but I don't see it. Uh, it's hard for the city to get involved more than saying, these are what our codes are. But every single time someone new comes in, you have to deal with it over and over and over. It's not appropriate in a neighborhood. Bruce. I might split the difference on this one and, and start with property owner only, uh, no exclude, not allowed for non-primary owner. Uh, In neighborhoods. And then revisit it down the road and see how, A, see how it's going, see if there have been, what the experience, community's experience with the concept has been. People get a little more comfortable with it. Maybe they get a little more willing to you know take that next step kind of thing but i think right out of the chute since it's new having a having the owner primary owner on site is probably the path of least resistance and more likely to generate a positive outcome as opposed to rolling the dice with non uh, non-primary owners so does this pertain to, say, you own a home and you rent it out for less than half the year, so you're the owner occupied for the rest of the year, more than half of the year, 
Is that what we're talking about here? I believe Correct. the way we had the business regulations, it was like up to three months. You didn't have to live there. We, we defined it. If I remember correctly, we defined it in the business regulations uh, that you about, could have a period of time as an owner-occupied STR that you weren't there, but it is your primary residence. So six, your primary residence. That's the definition because that's um, covered under IRS rules, right? Correct. So, okay. yeah. Correct. So I don't think it was six months. I think it was less. I'll find do out. You, okay. can you, do you see it, Ashley? Here? I'm looking at I have the little spinning circle right now, so. Okay, hold on. <laughs> we'll see if we get there first. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we circle back on that, but. So, so I, just wanted to I just wanted to clarify. So um, you're saying, uh, does this occur in downtown neighborhoods too? Or, or, or? So that was one of the questions as well. Of Do you uh, like it or, or is it? Uh, one standard in downtown and another somewhere else. But yeah, we, downtown is treated differently as neighborhoods. So we're, when we when we talk neighborhoods, and actually this came up at, at council. So in, for the purpose of as of of, of conversations when we're talking about the UAC, when I say neighborhoods, I'm talking about the residential zone districts, okay. where so, downtown has has separate. Um, zone district. So, so an owner doesn't have to be there in downtown? That is what we are proposing, that downtown could have either STR or uh, could have either primary or not primary. I would support that. I support what Bruce was saying, too. So. I think it's, a, it's kind of a yeah. little dip it, dipping your toe into it and see how it right. works. Ashley, you found it. Yep. So primary residence shall mean the dwelling unit in which a person resides for nine or more months of the calendar year. Under this definition, a person has only one primary residence at a time. Is that from city code or is that from the IRS? This is how it's written currently in our short-term rental code. Oh, okay. For business license. Okay. This is a, the business license regulations. Yes. That's where. And then... The definition of short-term rental, non-primary, primary, was taken from the business regulations and is also in the definitions in the UAUC. So I think there is a, defi a federal definition out there that has to do with whether you have to pay taxes, taxes on your... Where you live. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thoughts on that? You're next. Uh, short term rentals and short term. Oh, I've, I've said what I needed to say. Sorry. Okay, all right. Um, what should I have that? Um, I can't think what it is, so go ahead. Just a quick note uh, for the listening audience and the, and the commission members uh, I've had many calls on this about gee, what if we currently have a short term rental? and you change the regulations, what happens? And I've told people that I think the intent is that if you have a current license, you may renew that license indefinitely. As long as the license isn't either expired or revoked, you, uh, you, you are a, uh, wherever you are, whatever status it is, it can be renewed uh, once. Once the license is either uh, revoked or expires, then uh, all rules apply. You know, whatever rules that the city uh, decides to put in place for zoning, whether it's primary or non-primary, can be here, there, or anywhere, uh, those would apply upon uh, an existing short-term rental having their license either expire or, or be revoked. Okay, the next question pertains to how should the uses permitted as neighborhood convenience be determined and addressed in the land use matrix? So this is something that actually Robin brought to, brought to our attention, that we introduce this concept of neighborhood convenience, but don't really define it. So I'm going to see... So the direction that we gave is 
there is a superscript. So if it has a little four by it, a use is permitted only as a neighborhood convenience use subject to the standards of subsection um, 10432G, neighborhood convenience. Um, so there are, are now we've called out some uses that would be allowed in neighborhood convenience and then the standards associated neighborhood convenience. So something very important that is one of these standards Say if I'll jump me to that. Is it 10 dash? 10 4 3 G. 3 Sorry, 10 4 3.2 G. Um, so the important kind of clarification on this is neighborhood convenience uses, you have to be on a corridor or an arterial. Because it can't be like in the middle of of your block of single family homes. It would be if you, let's say, um, what's a good example? So like, you see the band? Yeah. So, and Windermere. Did you do it on Windermere? There's not a ton of but No, there are not a ton of locations. That would, it would so be. Zoning map. Windermere between Ridge Road and Littleton Boulevard. Could you do it there? Yeah, Ridge, yes. yeah, Ridge View is probably Ridge is, convenient. Is, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, I'm just trying to see where that says that. Um, trying to see where it has it. It has to be on. And are they going to show those on the zoning map? Um, so the... part of the conversation that we had to be that they have to be there. Yeah, so neighborhood convenience uses shall front on or immediately adjoin either a neighborhood or suburban connector as defined by the Littleton Transportation Master Plan. So in, in the TMP, there is a basically road designation map. Um, so we would have that. So no, we're not going to put it on the zoning map, gotcha. but it, it refers to a specific map. So it'd be interesting to see if that goes. Yeah, so it needs to link directly to that page. Neighborhood or suburban connector is defined by the transportation master plan. So, yeah. Yep. So that's a, a distinct definition. So let me go back. So does that answer the question, or? Um, I believe so. It's not necessarily a question specific. So I'm looking for one of the fours here. So we did have bar, group hub, or tavern. So you see, so medium lot residential, small lot residential, and multifamily residential. Again, there's very specific um, standards that go with that. So you can have a huge bar. You wouldn't. It wouldn't have the parking. It wouldn't. It's. It's really made to be a walkable um, uh, facility to go to. There was an interesting article in the latest planning magazine that talked about the, the driver COVID drivers that might stay with us, and that was one of them is the changing nature of work. Yes. And um, how neighborhood convenience is one thing that may come out of that, that folks are working from home. And, you know, instead of, you know, being able to go into town where they go to work and shop there, they're going to want to shop closer to home. Mm -hmm. So a more distributed network of supporting services maybe a future thing we should be planning for, so. Um, so I guess the, a, a question here would be, you know, as you look at the land use matrix and see what has been designated as a possible use as neighborhood convenience, like, are, are there, do you see challenges with some of them? Um, so office use is one of them, a commercial studio, um, a drug store without a drive through dry cleaning store or laundry mat. 
So just kind of if there's something that sticks out that doesn't seem to make sense. 7 Eleven on every corner. <laughs> <laughs> so, I want to go around quickly. I know we're at uh, our 8 o'clock now. Um, anybody want to? I haven't turned you into a pumpkin yet, so you're in luck. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's, I think your comment about the, you know, the, the article is right on, is spot on. I mean, and you look at other communities not necessarily Denver per se but I mean I remember various communities growing up in the Midwest where you know there were you know it was maybe a, a more urban oriented kind of environment versus strictly suburban uh, but yeah the neighborhood pub or you know get out you know, go down to the market or, you know, I mean, this was not, this is consistent with sort of historically what's happened in other, other, you know, parts of the country. Uh, so I think it's, I think it's, it's something we, yeah, probably, it, and I agree, I, I think certainly for some of the neighborhoods that are a little more dense it, it makes you know that it, it's certainly applicable but i i think some of your medium and large lot residential it's it's got to be on an arterial or or something i don't think you can pop in the middle of a of a block that's you know half acre lots yeah. i think we have to be really careful with this one it's kind of like the view quarter it's like this is new. It hasn't been vetted in our community. I'm a little concerned about throwing a tavern where people are not expecting it at this point. I would like to see more um, more discussion among the community before we do something as dramatic as this. Um, I also think we need to map it out on here to see exactly where it would be allowed before we made any decisions. I, I'm not particularly keen on putting bars near homes, especially, you know, is that an environment you want to raise your child in? It, it's, it really has, it depends on a lot of different things. I'm, I'm leery of it um, without doing a lot of vetting in our community to see what they think first. Those are good comments. Um. It's not to say that it, it wouldn't be appropriate. It's just that we haven't had that conversation. And different cultures and different, and Bezad was talking about, I think, at the last meeting that, you know, they've um, matured over time. I think of, you know, visiting England or Scotland, you know, where they have a pub on every corner. Here, it's not as socially acceptable. And like on a Broadway, that's, you know, where you would anticipate that. But, you know, we, we I, and when council was talking about this, you know, it came up like Wilmore. Wilmore is kind of in that place. And Wilmore fits in with the community. Of course, it's a nursery. It's it's quiet. Uh, the part that backs up to the homes are not where the public actually looks at stuff. But if you suddenly took Wilmore and you put bar, 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 I don't think it'd go over as well with the neighbors right behind it. So I'd be concerned about that. come with some pretty strong design standards and buffer requirements. I think some of those are in here. Mm -hmm. Yep. And they also talk about outdoor eating. That's noisy. That's just noisy. Um, I've seen some, where was it? Like Alameda and Pearl. Um, it, it, is it transitions from homes up to getting up to Alameda? Mm -hmm. There's this one lovely restaurant, and it's in a courtyard inside. You can't hear it anywhere. Yeah. So you wouldn't even know that they had these outdoor seating in there. That was wonderful. It was done well. It doesn't disturb the neighbors, um, but it's totally enclosed. You wouldn't even know it's there unless you went to it. Yeah. Um, can, we, can we see the map where, the, where this is? Had a, um, okay. I, I, guess, uh, to, I guess to your point, like I, I think neighborhood convenience is... Uh, the intersection of Bowles and Platte Canyon, and it's we've got bar, 
gardens, restaurants, all within walking distance of our house. And, and um, I know other neighborhoods, actually, that's where we meet. It's like the old pub. Um, and so, uh, and it's on an arterial, so maybe that's why, I mean, I don't know that there's noise issues. Um, um, Walter's Pizza, I think, was another one that's that was in... Uh, but those don't back up to houses. They are mm -hmm. separate. Walter's Pizza doesn't back up to houses. That's in its own little separate triangle. Yeah, but there's, there's homes. You know, yeah, but the, not right next to it. I'm talking about when you get smack dab next to it. You know, if you have the little bit of the distance, yeah, if you're on an arterial, those are a little different than what we're talking about here. Well, that's why I want to see if, do we really have a problem? That's why I want to see it on the map to see if that's, are they already sort of isolated by roads? I thought, uh, I thought there, there was a zone or a zoning map had it. I think you had it up there earlier. Our zoning map? I don't think. Yeah, what's that? Yeah, this is our zoning map. Calls yeah. out the neighborhood connectors. But I'm just trying to, this is where, this isn't. Does that show where the different types of streets are? Because that's what I think we're talking about. I guess I don't want to jump to excluding some of those uses um, because I know I know uh, many people in my community enjoy having those things there. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> As I understand the distinction, I know the one that. Uh, that you're talking about at Bulls and is it federal? The, uh, Bulls and Platt or Bull, yeah, okay. Platt and Union slash yeah. Lowell. I mean, there's uh, uh, local war. Local war, local local war is there. So, so, so that's more of a, I mean, that's zone commercial. I think this is um, in, a, in a neighborhood. I think it's, I think it's going to be uh, suburban or neighborhood convenience or something. So it'd be in, in, it'd be in a, a section that it can be a neighborhood, not commercial. So the yellow is the neighborhood connector. So any of the yellow ones are the neighborhood connectors. Um, and So Prince Street, neighbor, uh, Windermere, K uh, the K and Suburban Connect, right? Neighborhood Ridge connector suburban and Suburban Connector. Yeah, suburban so Suburban Connector, connector the is, are the blue. So this over here. But here, I mean, Platte Canyon is is a neighborhood connector, so that would that would apply. Ridge Road, you had talked about that. Um, Windermere. So say somebody okay. um, a scenario. So say somebody wanted to build a cafe terracotta type of place on Ridge Road in one of the homes that are there. What would the zoning look like? It would still be a a residential zoning with an overlay with a conditional use permit or so according to the proposed code you would be able to apply for a site development plan to uh, to have a, a, a neighborhood business that's identified on the map uh, that could be a restaurant with outdoor seating potentially and you would uh, apply to the city for that and we would measure it against the code standards and if it if it met the code standards, we'd approve it. That's why, does that sound right? But the underlying zoning would stay the same. Correct. Yes. I mean, these would be permitted uses along well, those corridors. A residential zone. It's so not a, it's a house one day and you turn it into a bar the next. Okay, that seems weird. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, well, okay. That, but, but I thought on the, excuse me, on the zoning map, there was something that was called neighborhood convenience. That's why, can we pull that up? Oh, uh, NC. NC. Or... So, yeah, that's, so, his, that's an actual zone district. I mean, right. So that is a really good point of clarification that maybe we should not be. Re it is, when we're talking neighborhood convenience, we're not. Neighborhood commercial, sorry. Uh, yes. That's, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't want to get those two confused. Yep. Yeah. So na neighborhood commercial is a zone district and neighborhood convenience as is a use. as a use type. Yeah, it's kind of always threw me for a loop but initially first, yeah. But I, I think those uh, uses would be allowed in all the neighborhoods as long as you're adjacent to one of those. 
neighborhood or it's uh, a urban streets, connector. Right. Yeah. It just seems like a conversation the community should start having with the floors down. Okay. All right. And then the last one is just um, so bed and breakfast. Um, we didn't. We no longer have a specific definition of boarding homes. Um, we're working on how how would that work if we had an additional caveat in the apartment definition. Um, so working on that, and then bed and breakfast we have classified as as commercial. Um, they are not a, a residential use. I wouldn't fall into the um, short-term rental category. And no, we treat them separately. How, is it, I mean, how, do, how does it function differently? So short-term rentals we're treating as either an other residential use or an accessory use. So a non primary short-term rental is now considered other residential use. A short-term primary is considered an accessory use. So those are kind of the classifications where a bed and breakfast is handled, <laughs> is considered a commercial use. I guess that to me kind of makes sense in terms of Robin's comment that these are commercial short-term rentals really are businesses too because it's very similar in the way you know Airbnb and a bed and breakfast function fairly similarly in terms of there's different people there every day but it's owner occupied or it could be it could be you're also typically talking Airbnb is t tends to be you know more like a really glorified hotel you've got a room sometimes you share a bathroom you know and you get a breakfast <coughs> but a, a short-term rental a lot is you get more of a house you might be doing your own food they they function they have different anticipated functions from what you would expect of them. But they're very similar, but they're different. Right. Similar, but different. <laughs> right, and making that differentiation. This is right, our, you know, our, if you get our a B first attempt at making that differentiation. Yeah, I mean, a B&B &B is just flat out commercial, whereas you know, an SDR can be the homeowner people into their home it, it, it's right. it's different in that sense though of course you do have strs where you just get the whole home but that's still different from a and b where you just get a room and a bathroom and typically food and some usually good food <laughs> so is there a question there uh, to refer uh, to the not at this point i mean so since we kind of put this list together we um uh, resolved. Have, have resolved the conflict um, so that's all we had okay. this evening. That's good. I went 14 minutes over. <laughs> Sorry. Why are you looking at me? I'm not the one who said no, you had to be done at eight. <laughs> and I did not meet the challenge. But for me, you know, I'm always late, so <laughs> it's right on time. <laughs> it's before 10. I'm happy. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So next week, um, we need just a couple reminders. So on Monday, you actually have a real live public hearing, um, and that is the PD amendment associated with Aspen Grove. Um, so we will hear from Mike and Anastasia on that one. And then on Wednesday, um, we have a special meeting. We are calling it a special meeting, so the public can come and make comments. Um, I think we will still be down here, but I need to clarify that with, with Reed and Colleen, if we can still be down here rather than on the dais. Um, we may have to do this, do the switching, open up the meeting, allow people to, to give comment, and then we can move down here. So um, the comments, are they focused um, around quite specific questions? Or? So for the public can comment anything you all you see or or anything else. Um, but I would imagine that their comments would be associated with the ULUC. So the focus of our our meeting um, will be uh, the, the red line draft. 
So I know it's not a ton of time to look at it, but we'll walk through the big issues. Um, I actually, Brett just did a really great presentation to council on that we did not get to do the whole thing due to the time that we started. We started a study session at 9.30 at night. Never a good idea. Um, so I actually, what I'll do for your packet, so you will, you've already received your packet for Monday and by tomorrow afternoon, you will have, you'll receive the packet for Wednesday. So I will put the ULUC briefing that um, Brett did because it highlights a, a bunch of different things. Um, and then we'll focus on the red line draft as well as the zoning map. So the zoning map is live. Um, we hope to tomorrow actually have an interactive zoning map so you can go in and make comments, put a pin, put a pin in it um, and, <laughs> and make comments. But right now it's just a PDF that's, that's online. So you can, I, I mean, since I'm letting you out early, it's not 10 yet. I mean, you can, no. Well, does that mean you're going back to work? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have to get a packet to you tomorrow. <laughs> so, um, so you off tomorrow morning. So so, I, thank you. <laughs> That's what we're going to get the package. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that will be our focus next week is, is the red line draft. And, you know, we're, we're just looking, did, did we hear everything? Did we, did we capture everything? So the red line draft is Wednesday, though, right? Yes. Okay. We will not be doing Monday. We Just the hearing. Yeah. When, when we did not have <coughs> Aspen Grove on the schedule, we were planning on having both Monday and Wednesday um, to talk about the, the red line draft, but Aspen Grove got in there. So we need to have a public hearing and we decided that you all didn't want a study session afterwards. You are right. <laughs> so. And how long will it be open for comment now again? So we're not, I mean, planning commission and city council and staff are taking this opportunity to do a lot of cross-checking and really we have it out to the public for their review. Um, there is not a comment uh, forum at this time that, that has closed, that, that closed on the 31st. So um, the, the final draft that will go through the public adoption process, whenever that will look like, um, will be, it will go static on the 10th of September. So at that time, um, any other changes that anyone sees um, would be necessary, would be, need to be offered up as amendments. So they want to make sure things are in by September 10th. So, I'm, and really I'm looking for September 2nd. If they're, er, that's when you want. Yes, all and I, I would call them at this point if there are fatal flaws. Because yeah. um, <laughs> again, remember, this is the first time we're touching this document wholeheartedly in 40 years. We're not going to be able to capture everything this go around, um, but we're setting the stage that it's easy to put the stuff in. Because um, as you will remember, when we tried to put in the downtown stuff, it wasn't it wasn't really easy. So we're really trying to set up the a framework, a very robust framework that'll be easy to put in new things. Can we cover it all? Yeah. Any other comments from commissioners' questions? Otherwise, we'll adjourn and let you get some sleep or get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe both. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for being here tonight. I know it's a special night, and I appreciate your comments. Okay. Thanks.